welcome to our broadcast for today. We thank the Lord that he has made it possible for us to be together again. Please stay where you are. Get ready to be positively impacted by the powerful word of God that we share with you today. Did you know that there are over 50 roles that are recorded in the Bible about the Holy Ghost, the roles he plays in our lives. Over 50 of them are recorded in the Bible. Well, there's no way I can share all 50 with you today, but one of them I have selected and it will be the focus of my sermon for today. As I round up our series on the Easter season, this promises to be a great blessing. Please stay where you are and get ready to be truly blessed by God. But I don't want you alone partaking of this blessing, please. Kindly notify a friend and call a neighbor and share the link with somebody so they can also listen or so they can watch, so they can also be blessed. Like I know you will be blessed. Everyone deserves to be part of this. Now, while you do that, I would like to invite you to please check us out on my podcast. That is Bishop Etiola's podcast. You can access my podcast by downloading my podcast app on the Google Play Store for those of you that use the Android phone. Or you can listen directly on the Spreaker app, which can be downloaded for both the Android and the Apple phone. Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R. -E -E Actually, you can listen to my podcast on any podcast providing uh, company, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, we're all there. Just put in my name, Bishop Itiola, and you will be joining people from over 50 countries around the world that have downloaded, believe it or not, over 128,000 episodes in sermons and in prayers. People are being blessed and we want you to be part of the blessing. I also plead with you to please help us share about our podcast, but not our podcast alone. Let others know about our presence on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, and of course on television, yes. We're on TV in Guyana, the great country of Guyana. And we're on the giant RBS TV 13. Every Saturday, they put us on from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. local time. I just want to let the folks at that station know how much we appreciate them and how much we appreciate those who work for them. We also appreciate those of you that are watching us right now in 23 Caribbean island countries through Mercy and Truth TV based in Jamaica. We're on there every Saturday from 2.30 to 3.30 local time. And every Wednesday morning, bright and early at 1.30 a.m. That is local time also. I'm never tired of praying for the owners and the workers of those stations. I pray for you that God will be with you and that God will enlarge your coasts. And the great countries of Jamaica and Guyana, my prayer for you today is that you will know peace in your countries. And by the way, don't forget to listen to us on our own very radio station, Fresh Waves Radio. It is on 24 seven. And on that station, you can listen to a variety of programming that will surely bless your soul. Fresh Waves Radio. You can download the app for both the Android and the Apple phones from their respective app 
stores. Just type in French Waves Radio. Install the app and you are good to go. Or if you want to just watch and listen on your computer, rather, you can just type in freshwavesradio.com. Scroll down a little bit and press listen. And you'll be ready to go. Please help us spread the word also. Don't forget our outreach every Thursday night and every Friday night, this week inclusive, 7 p.m. New York time. If you've never joined us to pray, this will be a good week for you to do so. That'll be 7 p.m. live on my Facebook page and all the other handles that you watch us or listen to us. We are on there every Thursday night and every Friday night. People's lives have been impacted by these prayers. That's 7 p.m. New York time. Like they say, a trial is all you need will convince you to come back and keep coming again. So please do your best to join us this Thursday. Do your best to join us this Friday for a life-changing experience, praying at the throne of mercy. Those are all my announcements. Now let's announce to God that we are here. We need his help because without him, we can do nothing. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we need your help today, even as we bring the word of God. It's your word. We need your backing. So I release myself to you. I surrender myself to you. Please use me to your glory. And let your people who are watching me or listening to me be greatly blessed. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Everybody said amen. And amen, the title of my sermon for today is simple, quickened by the Spirit. Quickened by the Spirit. I said I'm going to round up my, my Easter series, and this will be the last. Did you know that the Holy Spirit played a very, very important role in the resurrection event? Yes, he did. And I would like to address how you can tap into and benefit from the role of the Holy Ghost. There are well over 50 recorded duties of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Let me mention the first 12 that I have written in my notes here for you. Number one, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin of righteousness, and of judgment. Yes, that's in John 16, 8. The Holy Spirit also guides us into all truth. That's in John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit also regenerates us. John 3, 5 through 8, and Titus 3, 5. Number four. The Holy Spirit glorifies and testifies of Christ. Yes, he does. You find that in John 15, 26 and John 16, 14. The Spirit also reveals Christ to us and in us. You find that in John 16, 14 and 15. Number six, the Spirit leads us. You find that in Romans 8, 14, Galatians 5, 18, Matthew 4, 1, and Luke chapter 4, verse 1 also. Number seven, the Spirit of God sanctifies us. You find that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 1 Peter 1, 2, and Romans 5, 16. Number eight, the Spirit empowers us. Luke 4, 14, Luke 24, 49, in Romans 15, 19. Number nine, the Spirit fills us. Ephesians 5, 18, Acts 2, 4, Acts 4, 8, and Acts chapter 9, verse 17. Number 10, the Holy Spirit teaches us to pray. You better believe he does. Romans 8, 26 and 27, and Jude, verse 20. Number seven, the Spirit bears us witness that we are the children of God. We'll find that in Romans chapter 8, 
in verse number 16. The last but not the least that I will let you know about is the Spirit produces in us the fruit or the evidence of his work and of his presence. That's in Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. What about the 13th duty? Yes, that is what I would like to share with you today. It is recorded by both Peter and Paul in the New Testament, this major role of the Holy Spirit. Let me read to you what Peter said, and I will read to you what Paul also said. Peter said in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but, look at the next four words, quickened by the Spirit quickened by the Spirit. That right there was what took place on the resurrection morning. But that work that the Holy Spirit did, he still does today. Take a look at what Paul said in Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells inside you. Now what Paul said is very simple to understand. God by his spirit raise Christ up from the dead, that same Spirit of God dwells inside the believer to do what he did for Christ on resurrection morning. As you all know, the Holy Spirit is always part of the salvation work in all those who are born again. Jesus made that abundantly clear when he discussed with Nicodemus in John 3, 14, let me read it to you. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, you shall be and must be born again. Now look at the next statement. The one bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit, born of the spirit, Born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. See that? All believers are born again by the power of the Spirit of the living God. When that happens, the Spirit of God does not depart. Uh -uh. Rather, he stays in and with the believer to walk in him and around him. So Peter and Paul use the same word, quicken, quicken. Like I said earlier, that is one of the 50 things the Bible says that the Holy Spirit does. The Spirit of God quickens, quickens. What does it mean to quicken, you ask? To quicken is to make alive. To quicken is to revive. And that was exactly what happened to Jesus on that glorious resurrection morning. And that is what the Holy Spirit can do in your life and can do in my life on a daily basis. What's that? To quicken, to quicken us, to quicken us. 
You see, folks, there is no reason why a believer should be spiritually dead or even cold when the Holy Spirit can make him or her not just to live, but to be fully alive. You and I have no excuse, folks, to be spiritually slow. We have no excuse to be spiritually sluggish. The believer, yielding to the same spirit that raised Jesus up, should not be spiritually slow. Uh -uh. You should not be spiritually dull. You should not act as if you are spiritually drained. That spirit inside you makes you fervent and puts you on fire for God, burning with intensity for God Almighty. The Spirit of God makes you vigorous. The Spirit of God makes you energetic in your walk with God Almighty. You know, Paul made it very clear in that verse that if we are born again, the Spirit of God dwells in us, and one of his purposes in us is what it was for Jesus on resurrection morning. What was the purpose? To quicken, to quicken, to quicken us and make us not just alive, but to be fully alive in God. That is the expected state, folks, of the believer who allows the Spirit of God to have his way in their lives. God wants you to be quickened, to be alive, alive for God. And we find this from biblical admonitions and biblical examples. Let me show you one admonition, and I'll show you several examples of people who are on fire for God. The admonition is very clear in Romans chapter 12, verse 11. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. God doesn't want you to serve him in a cold manner. God wants you and I to be fervent in the spirit, hot, boiling, zealous, vigorous, serving the Lord. If we can have more believers serve God like that, all this foolishness that we see going on in the world will not even have a place so that's the admonition. Now let's look at the examples of people like you and I who took it up and allowed the spirit of the living God to quicken them and make them who God really wanted them to be. Here we go. Acts chapter 18. Let's begin there in verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos born at Alexandria. Look at the qualifications of this guy. An eloquent man, mighty in scriptures. He came to Ephesus. This man, the Bible says, was instructed in the way of the Lord. Now look at the next statement. And being fervent in the spirit, he spake and talked diligently the things of the Lord, Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. He was fervent in the spirit. Wow. What a beautiful way to describe a Christian. Fervent, hot, boiling, zealous in the spirit. May God make that your description in this day and age when there's so much coldness in the body of Christ. Check another example out. And this will bless you. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Look at the next statement. 
always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Do you see the prayer life of Epaphras? He wasn't the one that you pray and you are asleep. The one that you pray and you are running all over the uh, departmental stores around your area. That one is not fervent praying. The one that you pray and by the time you wake up, you find saliva all over your mouth. That one is not praying fervently. That one is not the Holy Ghost at work. That one is sleep at work. This man confessed that Epaphras was a fervent laborer in prayer. And he wasn't even praying for himself. He was praying for these saints that they may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. When you can pray like this for others, you can imagine how you pray for yourself. Then he said about him, for I bear him record that he hath a zeal for you. Did you see that? He has a zeal for you. It's not by mind, it's not by power. It's the spirit of God that, is in, that was in his life that quickened him to be zealous. Can it be written like this about you? Can it be written like this about me? This fervency affected his prayer life and it shall affect the prayer life of every single believer. James chapter 5 verse 16 makes it clear. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Now look at the next statement. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's the fervency again. That's the quickening again. When you allow the Holy Spirit to be who he wants to be in your life, you will be quickened. Your prayer life will be fiery prayer life. But not only do they pray fervently, they also love fervently. First Peter 1.22, look at what it says. First Peter 1.22 tells us, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. I love, I love Paul and the rest of them. Peter and the rest of the writers in the New Testament. So make sure you love one another. And the type of love that I'm asking you to love one another is the one that the Holy Ghost quickens you to. And it always fervent, it's always hot, it's always boiling. Listen, people, you and I don't have any excuse. Seriously, we don't have any excuse whatsoever not to be fervent. Because all these people who should fervency in the spirit will come and ask us questions. Why, why were you the way you are when you lived in Africa, when you lived in uh, Asia, when you lived in America? Why were you so cold? Was it not the same spirit that we received, that you received? That was why Jesus had problem with one of the churches he sent messages to in the book of Revelation. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Look at what it said. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I will you are cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cool nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. Listen, folks, the Holy Ghost inside you, you've got to decide whether you want to just disown the Holy Ghost and be cold or let the Holy Ghost be who he is in your life. Don't be cold. Don't be lukewarm. Let the Holy Spirit quicken you so you will be hot. That's the will of God for us. 
And he said, if you refuse to be hot, I will spill you out of my mouth. May that never be your portion. You say, hold it, Bishop, hold it. I have an observation to make, you said. So, Bishop, I know of many believers, many, who are assumed to have the Spirit of God in them because they are born again, yet they are spiritually slow and they are spiritually sluggish. They look and act spiritually dull and spiritually drained. Not much fire, not much fervency that you can see in them. If truly the spirit of the living God that quickened Jesus Christ lives in every believer, shouldn't we all be hot? Shouldn't we all be boiling for the master? Shouldn't we all be vigorous and zealous for the master if truly the spirit of God is in us? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, we should be. Do you notice that the moment the Spirit of God came on resurrection morning and quickened Jesus, Jesus never died again. No, yeah, he never died again. That's unlike what we see today, folks. Many who have the quickening Holy Ghost in them are dying and waking and dying and waking up spiritually. I see the Holy Ghost in them is like the electricity supply in some third world countries. Today you have light, the next 30 days, no light. And that is the experience of many today. I remember when I was uh, young in the faith, I used to go to a church where the children would come after Sunday school and do a presentation. And one of the songs they sang one day that I'll never forget, I will never forget. So when you are up, you are up. When you are down, you are down. But when you are halfway up or down, you are neither up nor down. My Lord. When you are hot, you are hot. When you are cold, you are cold. But when you are halfway hot and cold, you are neither hot nor cold. The song I'm telling you now is about 40 something years ago I heard it and it stayed here. I'll never forget that presentation. Those children must have grown up now, married, and I hope they are still in Christ. But that's the way it is. Many are hot, many are cold. Some are just midway between. Now what's the Holy Ghost doing in your life? And that's why Jesus Christ rebuked the church in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These things saith he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, and know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, but you are dead. You know you are born again. You know you have the Spirit of God in you, but you also know you don't feel vigorous. You don't feel fully alive. You don't feel fervent. And you don't feel energetic in the Spirit. If you're in that category this Easter season, please allow me to help you because I think I have a word for you that will help you turn up the fire of the Holy Ghost inside you. You see, it's all about relationship. That's it. How you relate with the Holy Spirit determines whether you are spiritually dull or spiritually alive. Will you permit me to say that one more time? How you relate with the Holy Spirit determines whether you are spiritually dull or spiritually alive. It's like the tagline 
of a New York bank. They always say the right relationship is everything. That's it, folks. The right relationship with the Holy Ghost is everything. What must you do to relate well with the Holy Ghost and trigger the quickening power of the Holy Ghost in you? That's what I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to share with you three simple things, three important areas that you need to pay attention to. If you will pay attention to these three areas, the Holy Spirit will never ever lie dormant in your life. You ready? You're going to be blessed by this. Number one, you must intentionally avoid grieving the Holy Ghost. Did you hear what I just said? If you want to be quickened all the time and stay quickened, then you have to intentionally avoid grieving the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 tells us very plainly, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed, unto the day of redemption. I want you to notice that expression, ye are sealed. The Holy Spirit is our seal. Unfortunately, it's like the engine of an automobile. It has a seal. When the seal of the automobile engine breaks, what happens? The oil leaks out. And if the oil keeps leaking out and you don't do anything about it and you keep driving the car, what happens? The engine knocks. It's the same thing with us. Many people's spiritual engine has knocked. Countless. Why? They allow the seal to break. And all the oil flows out and they are spiritually dry. Have you ever experienced spiritual dryness? It's because of what is happening to the Spirit of God inside you. You are grieving Him. Paul specifically mentions some things that particularly grieve the Holy Spirit. Look at the next verse. Ephesians 4.31. He said, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. And be a kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Can you now see, folks? Why the fire of the Spirit is extinguished in us? Because these are the things people indulge in in churches. These are the things believers indulge in. Bitterness, wrath, anger. Churches are filled with people who don't talk to one another. Churches are filled with couples who don't talk to one another. Evil speaking in the house of God. He said, put them away. Put malice away. Because if you don't, the Holy Spirit's fire will die in you. He said, be kind to one another, be tender-hearted, forgive, forget. Even as Christ has forgiven you, or God has forgiven you for Christ's sake. So you see now why, why, why there is so much coldness in believers all, all around us. Because we violate these things, we grieve the Holy Spirit. The key word here is grieve, grieve. And most Bible versions are very consistent in how they translate that verse. Some of the looser translations of the Greek text 
choose other words, and they provide some interesting insights into what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit. For example, the CSB version says, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You are sealed by him for the day of redemption. The CEB version says, and don't make the Holy Spirit of God unhappy. You are sealed by him for the day of redemption. The contemporary English version says, don't make God's spirit sad. The spirits make you sure that someday you will be free from your sins. The MSG, the Message Bible, it says, don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. Don't break the heart of his Holy Spirit that is moving and breathing in you. He's the most intimate part of your life, making you fit for himself. Don't take such a gift for granted. I like these translations. And look at what the Amplified Translation says. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, marked, and branded as God's own secured. For the day of redemption, of the final deliverance through Christ from evil and all the consciences of sin. There is nothing earth-shattering about those translations. They simply describe the grieving of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to notice that they use words like sad, Words like unhappy, in the place of grief or grieve. Also, I wanted to take note of the Amplified Bible version of the Bible and of that verse. It described, and it is designed to give you extra insight into the key words of that verse. The Amplified adds, do not offend, do not vex. Do not sadden the Holy Spirit. The Greek word that is translated to grieve in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, where we read, it means to cause to feel sorrow, pain, unhappiness, distress. Now, as a third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit has a personality and the ability to feel emotions, emotions like joy, emotions like outrage, emotions like sorrow. Remember in Acts chapter seven, verse 51, Stephen condemns resisting the spirit. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, Paul instructs the believers not to quench the spirit. But the only time grieving the Spirit is mentioned in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, is here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Paul's command to us not to grieve the Spirit seems to be inspired by two Old Testament verses that speak of God's Spirit being distressed, God's Spirit being grieved and made bitter. In both Isaiah 63 and Ephesians chapter 4, grieving the Holy Ghost is associated with God's people having an inappropriate response to his redemption. Inappropriate response to his redemption. Do not grieve the Spirit. It appears to complement Paul's opening exhortation to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Did you hear that? When you and I live lives that are not worthy of the calling that we have received, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul was saying, be completely humble, be completely gentle, be patient, bearing one another's burdens and bearing with one another in love. He was saying, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Believers, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do not maintain peace and harmony in the body of Christ. Paul then gives some specific ways to, give the, to grieve the Holy Spirit. I told you that earlier. 
as living as we used to live before we got saved, when we were separated from the life of God. There are people you still wonder whether they are born again or not. You are grieving the spirit and you cannot be hard and fervent with that kind of lifestyle. We grieve him when we don't speak truthfully to our brothers and to our sisters in Christ. When we let anger control our actions, when we steal from each other, and even when we steal from God, and when we speak foul language, abusive words to one another, instead of words that are uplifting and instead of words that are encouraging. Of course, we also grieve the Holy Spirit when we don't get rid of all bitterness, like I said earlier, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. And when we fail to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven us. So we see the Holy Spirit of God lives within the Christian. Yes. We are his temple. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. And when we don't walk in the holiness and love of Christ and in harmony with other believers, we grieve the Spirit of God with our sinful thoughts and with our sinful behaviors. So grieving the Holy Spirit is also equivalent and similar to quenching the Holy Spirit. So you quench the fire of the Holy Spirit inside you. What happens? You become cold, like many people today are cold. Quenching the Spirit speaks of stifling or suppressing the fire of God's spirit that burns within every believer. Don't turn off the fire. The Holy Spirit desires to express himself in our actions and in our attitudes. Now, when we don't allow that same spirit to be seen in our behavior, when we don't allow ourselves to walk away from that which is wrong, then we suppress or we quench the spirit of God. We do not allow the Spirit then to reveal himself as he wants to do, to show love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and of course, self-control, as Galatians chapter 5 tells us. Folks, both quenching the Spirit and grieving the Spirit, they hinder a godly lifestyle. And both of them happen when we sin against God and follow our own worldly desires, living as we did before accepting Christ's salvation. And the only correct road that you should follow from now on is the one that will lead you closer to God, closer to purity, and farther and farther away from the world and from sin. Just as you and I don't like to be grieved, so should we not grieve God. So should we not quench or grieve the Holy Spirit by our actions or by refusing to yield to his leadings. Oh, did I just say that? Yield to his leadings? Yes, I did. The last statement, yield to his leadings, leads me to the next point. If the Spirit is to quicken us like he did to Jesus, listen to me, people, then we must listen to and act on his leadings, on his promptings. When you don't, it grieves him. The Holy Spirit speaks to us as children in many ways, many, many ways, including still a small voice inside you, including conviction of unease about a decision. You make a decision, you make uh, up your mind you're going to go this route, and then you feel uneasy about it. That's the Holy Spirit talking to you and saying, abandon that project, abandon that plan, don't go that route. When you abandon it, the Holy Spirit is happy with you. 
His fire burns inside you more. He speaks to us through sudden thoughts of wisdom. He just dumps a thought of wisdom inside you. If you listen to it, you make him happy. He nudges us, nudges us to act on specific something. Confirmation through scriptures. You are reading the Bible about something, and bingo, that's the scripture right there. And it speaks to what you've been uh, thinking about. That's the Holy Spirit talking. What about spiritual dreams and visions? I hope you are not one of those who don't believe in dreams and visions. Messages through other believers. Sometimes we call them confirmations. When his message comes to you in any of those ways, act, obey. When you do, the fire of the Holy Ghost ignites in you. But the more he talks and the more you say, no, I don't want to listen. I don't want to go that route. The Holy Spirit is gentle. He just be quiet. He's quiet. And he withdraws himself. And you discover that the fire of God in you burns lower and lower and lower till it's completely extinguished. And you become cold. May the Lord have mercy on us. I've given you two things you must do in order for the fire in you to be quickened, 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 in order for you to be more zealous than you are. Let me give you one more, and this is very, very important. What must I do if the Spirit of God in me is to be quickened? Very simple. Spend quality time praying in the Spirit. Spend quality time praying in the Spirit. Now, when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're given a prayer language. That's what we mean by praying in the Spirit. Another expression for that is praying in unknown tongues. There are two ways to pray. You can pray in the language you understand, and you can pray in the language you don't understand, which is the language of the Spirit. Now, you ask me, Bishop, what connection does that have with making a believer come alive? What connection does speaking in tongues and praying in the Spirit have with a believer coming alive? Oh, many connections. Wish I had time to teach on that. But one of them is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, A, the beginning of verse 4. 1 Corinthians 14. Listen to what it says. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. You see what I mean now? When you pray in the Spirit, you edify yourself. I checked out the word edify in the Webster's Dictionary. I love what it says. It says the word edify Edify is the same word as develop, uh -huh. elevate, uplift, make better. Now that means that those who pray a lot in the spirit are not likely to be spiritually dull. Uh -uh. They are not likely to be spiritually sluggish. Uh -uh. They will not be slow and low-energy Christians. My admonition to you today, if you want to be quickened and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, if you want to be fervent and hot and boiling, you speak English when you pray, lay it aside for a while. You speak uh, Spanish when you pray, lay it aside for a while. You speak French when you pray, Lay it aside for a while. You speak an African language when you pray. Lay it aside for a while. And pray in the Holy Ghost. And pray in the Spirit. Be known as a man and a woman who spends hours praying in the Spirit. That's one language that the devil does not understand. How can you block what you don't understand? It's impossible. Pray with your understanding, all right? But please, pray much in the Spirit also. The reason is very simple. According to this scripture, 
the one that prays in the Spirit quickens himself, edifies himself. Now, I want you to look at that verse again. And let me help you with something. Something I see all the time on the internet. It says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Did you see that? Say, He that prays in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Now, someone asked me a question a couple of months ago. And I just smiled. When that question was thrown at me, it's a bishop. And notice you don't blast away in tongues in church. And notice that when you lead prayers online, every Thursday and every Friday, I've never caught you speaking in tongues and praying in tongues like some people do on the internet. And the person said, why? Does that mean you don't believe in speaking in tongues and praying in tongues? I smiled. I said, my friend, the answer to my silence is in that verse. You know what that verse says? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Can I repeat that? He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, edifieth himself. You get it? So of what use is it to lead people in prayer online or lead a song in church and start blasting away in tongues when the tongues only edifies me and not the people I'm leading in prayer? You understand what I'm saying now? I am leading people in prayer. Pray this way, pray that way, pray that way, pray that way. And then instead of giving them prayer points or telling them to pray and encouraging them to pray, I'm just going, I am edifying myself. It does them no good. So I give them prayer points in a language that they understand. If they want to pray in the spirit, that's their own. But for me, Listen, I'm here to encourage you to pray. Uh, my praying in tongues does you no good. It only does me good. So I laugh when I hear someone leading prayers and start praying and, and start going on in tongues. And people will be saying, I receive. You receive what? You don't even know what he's talking about. And the tongues is praying in does not concern you. It's edification for him and between him and God. I receive. Amen, Papa. Come on, all this lack of understanding, all this lack of knowledge. It's, it's so common among the charismatic circles and among the Pentecostal circles. So I told the person who said I don't pray in tongues, I said, come and meet me in my closet where I edify myself. I edify myself before I come to edify the church. All right? When it's me and God, where I need personal edification, come and see whether I believe in praying in tongues or not. You know, it's like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. You know what he said? You need to hear this. He said, I speak in tongues more than all of you, talking about the Corinthians, yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding than 10 thousand words in tongues like the show off that you see among Pentecostal preachers and singers on the internet. Let's go back to the Bible. He even said if you are going to speak in tongues, don't speak it if there's no one to interpret. And we just go and you are leading prayer. And I'm there for the first time. I'm looking at you and saying, what is this one saying? Well, he's edifying himself, but he's not doing me any good. Paul said, if you do that, won't an unbeliever come there and say you are mad? It's unfortunate that we have left the Bible and it's now show that we do in God's house. So practice more praying in the spirit. Edify yourself. It builds you up. It elevates you, kindling the fire of God in you. 
So as I close, I want to plead with you, my friends. You don't have to be cold. You don't have to be dull. You don't have to be drained spiritually. Don't allow the Spirit of God to be dormant in your life. Let him come alive. And as the Spirit of God comes alive in you this Easter season, wow, great things will happen. And please don't grieve him. And please don't forget to listen to his promptings and act accordingly. And don't forget to pray in the Spirit more often than you do. I told them in church the other day that sermons that I preach, if I can just pray in the Spirit for about five or ten minutes before I go to the pulpit, I feel the difference. I see the difference. When I'm driving to church on Sunday, I pray in the Spirit from my house to church, just edifying myself, charging myself up. And then when I get behind the pulpit, I preach. I don't go there and start speaking in tongues for one hour. I already took care of that at home. May the Lord help you to understand all I have said. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray for my friends that are watching me all around the world. I pray that you will quicken us all and help us to be doers of that which we have heard. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll be back again next week by the grace of God. We look forward to seeing you. Bye-bye.